wasn't sure. Oh, it says April 10th on here. I did read it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good catch, uh, Council Member Zirin. It is Wednesday, April 24th. And uh, I called the meeting to order. So how's that? <laughs> we do like Groundhog Day. So welcome. Uh, first item is uh, approval of agenda. The first order of business is is approving the agenda. Can I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda? So moved. Okay. There's a motion and a second. <clears throat> Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The motion is adopted. Approval of minutes. Approval of the April 10th meeting minutes. Can I have a motion and a second for approval? So moved. Second. Okay. There's a motion. Uh, is there any discussion? Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The motion is adopted. Next we have the public invitation and this is an invitation to interested persons to address the council on matters not on the agenda. Public comment on the agenda items um, has occurred in the respective committees. And so I know um, Liz Sund, who is our recording secretary, has the list. And is there anybody on there tonight? No. no. So we don't have anybody uh, in terms of um, public comment. Is there anybody? We'll just ask in the audience if there's anybody here. Okay. So we will move on to the next item. Uh, which is business items. Um, the first is 2019-55, uh, which is the unified budget amendment for 2019, the first quarter. Um, and they, this will be a roll call vote, members. That's where they will call um, each of your names. Uh, and I, this is going to be present. So, okay. Ah, Council Member Ferguson will present this. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And this is business item 2019-30, Unified Budget Amendment. Council has a quarterly amendment process for its budget. Budget amendments, amendments are heard individually at, in the respective operating committee and as a whole in the management committee before coming before the council. This amendment includes proposed changes to both the operating and capital components of the unified budget and reflects items from the transportation and communi community development uh, committees. On the capital side of the unified budget, Divisions are proposing routine adjustments to remove completed projects from the authorized capital program and to move, to move projects from the capital improvement plan to the authorized capital program. Projects moving to the authorized, moving to authorized have funding secured. Community development is proposing to remove 14.2 million in completed projects and bringing 1.5 million additional funding and projects into the authorized capital program. Funding includes replacing project funding from previously awarded environmental and natural resources trust funds with state general obligation bonds awarded in this legislative session and adding new funds for interest earnings and bond, and bond proceeds. The state GO bonds are allocated to each park agency by formula set in, sta in state statute. Transportation is proposing to remove 15.4 million in completed projects and move nearly 25 million in, in projects where federal, state, local, and regional funding have been secured from plan to authorized. On the operating side of the unified budget, the transportation division is proposing to transfer and exchange motor vehicle sales tax revenues from the operating budget with federal revenues in the capital program. The federal revenues are eligible to fund operating expense and the MVST funds will be used in the capital program to fund projects that are not eligible by council policy to be funded with regional bonds because they do not result in a new fixed asset and have a use or have a useful life shorter than the bond maturity. For example, engines, transmission, midlife vehicle rehabilitations. This amendment has been reviewed and approved by the Transportation, Transportation Community Development and Management Committees. The motion is that the Metropolitan Council authorize the amendment of the 2019 Unified Budget as indicated in accordance with the attached tables. Thank you for the motion. Is there a second? Second. So there's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Okay. Seeing none, I will have uh, Liz please call the roll. Okay. Council Member Johnson. Absent. Council Member Chambliss. Absent. Council Member Ferguson? Aye. Council Member Barber? Aye. Council Member Cummings? Aye. 
Council Member Atlas Ingebretson. Aye. Council Member Lilligren. Aye. Council Member Muse. Aye. Council Member Zuren. Aye. Oh, sorry. Council Member Lindstrom. Aye. <laughs> Council Member Vento. Aye. Council Member Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. Council Member Fredson. Council Member Sterner. Aye. Council Member Wolf. Aye. Chair Swap. Aye. So hearing eyes all, the motion is carried. So thank you and thank you for your report, uh, Council Member Ferguson. Uh, we do not have a consent agenda today, so we will move right into the reports of standing committees. So Council Member Lilligren. Thank you, Madam Chair. My apologies for being late. Uh, Madam Chair and Council Members, the first action brought forward by the Community Development Committee is a grant project scope change for the Mississippi Regional uh, Trail. And uh, Dakota County requests that the Metropolitan Council approve the grant project scope change for unexecuted parks grant SG-22058 to change the projects from the project from the Mississippi River Regional Trail construction project to the Lake Billisby Regional Park Construction Improvements. This grant uses both state uh, bond funds. The Metropolitan Council has not executed the original grant agreement uh, with Dakota County. Dakota County experienced numerous project complexities regarding trail acquisition, design, and engineering that delayed the original Mississippi Regional Trail project. As such, the county has not used funds connected with the original proposed project. Instead, Dakota County proposes to change the project to implement improvements at Lake Billisby Regional Park. The components of the proposed improvements are comprehensively defined in the Lake Billisby Park Regional Park Master Plan, <coughs> which the council approved on May 23, 2018. This request was approved unanimously at the April 4, 2019 Metropolitan Parks and Open Space Commission meeting and the meeting of April 15, 2019 Community Development Committee meeting. So, I, uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council approve the grant project scope change for Dakota County Grant Agreement, SG-20-22058, to modify the project from the Mississippi River Regional Trail Construction Project to the Lake Billisby Regional Park Construction Improvements. Thank you, Councilmember Lilligren. There is a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Hearing a second. Uh, is there any further discussion? All those, uh, Councilmember Sterner. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I just had a question. Where was the trail for the Mississippi River uh, going to go previously? Councilmember Lilligren. And I would turn to staff, Madam Chair. So I'll ask staff to come up. Community Development Director, Lisa Barajas. Thank you, Madam Chair, Council Members. Um, Mississippi, Region, Mississippi River Regional Trail in Dakota County is meant to run along that northern portion of the county, <clears throat> right along the Mississippi River, connecting, I believe, Spring Lake Park Reserve um, and going along there. There's a lot of property owners in that area, lots of acquisition. Um, problems that they had run into. They're still going to move forward with the project. They're not going to scrap it, but they do um, think that they would not be able to complete the project within the time frames required by the grant. Okay. Council Member Sterner. Uh, just a follow-up uh, question. Uh, there also is a trail looking at going from Egan, Lebanon Hills out to the River Strait uh, through Flint Hill land. Is that still in the works of uh, looking at it as an option of other trail system with wildlife and bicycle trail, et cetera? Ms. Barajas. Madam Chair, Councilmember Sterner. I believe Dakota County talked about that. Councilmember Wolf probably knows more about this one than I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Any yeah, um, Councilmember Wolf? Thank you, Madam Chair. That trail will connect with the Mississippi Regional Trail as well. There's several trails that come together in that area, but this one section is really difficult to get through. It's in a kind of an industrial park area. And there's railroad right-of-ways that you have to cross and a lot of complexity there. So rather than do something where they'd not be able to get it done in time, they're just shifting their order of work. They're still working on the other trail. And, and I believe the connection is between Spring... It's, it's a portion of the trail between Spring Lake Regional Park and the Pine Bend Trailhead. Ms. Barajas, any, any further Chair, comments? Council Member, that's 
Thank you. Anything else? All right. Thank you. So there is a motion on the floor for business item 2019-68. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. The motion passes. Thank you. And your next item? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Community Development Committee brings a second item for approved for consideration today. It's a comprehensive plan, the Dakota County 2040 Comprehensive Plan. Uh, this is a single business item. It did not go through joint committees because uh, Dakota County does not connect to the regional wastewater system and therefore only went through the Community Development Committee. Uh, Thrive MSP 2040 forecast growth of over just under 34,000 new households in the community through 2040 and an increase of over 32,000 jobs. Uh, in the northern portion of the county, Thrive designates the first ring suburbs as urban center. The second ring communities along the Minnesota River are considered urban and suburban. The third and fourth ring communities have been designated suburban edge and emerging suburban edge. And a few small standalone communities are either rural, diversified rural, or rural residential. The rest of the county is, has an agricultural designation. Dakota County does not have land use planning authority and therefore has different plan requirements than cities and townships in the region. And the counties are responsible for transportation planning and park planning. Dakota County is one, is one of 10 regional parks implementing agencies. And the county's plan must still be consistent with the other council's policies as described in the staff report. Uh, staff. Council staff find that the county's 2040 plan confirms to regional systems plans, is consistent with council policies, and is compatible with the plans of adjacent and affected jurisdictions. So, Madam Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council adopt the attached advisory comments and review record and take the following actions. Authorize Dakota County to place its 2040 comprehensive plan into effect and to advise the county to adopt the Mississippi River Corridor Critical Area component of their 2040 Comprehensive Plan within 60 days after receiving the final approval from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources and submit a copy of the final adopted plan and evidence of adoption to the DNR Council and National Park Service within 10 days of adoption. Thank you, Council Member Lindegren. Good report. There's a motion for business item 2019-80. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The motion is adopted. <coughs> Thank you. Next on the agenda, uh, environment, there is no report, correct? Okay. No report. Uh, management, no report? No additional report. Okay. Transportation, Council Member Barber. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have four reports on the agenda this evening. Um, Madam Chair, Council Members, business item number 2019-69 is regarding the declaration of 2425 Minnehaha Avenue as surplus and the sale of that property to At Last Gourmet Foods Incorporated for $1,650,000. 2425 Minnehaha Avenue will be vacated during the summer of 2019. The facilities analysis identified no near-term council use for the property. A market analysis revealed private sector interest in the property. On December 17, 2018, the procurement department issued an invitation for bids to purchase the property. The bidding process closed at the end of February 2019. The highest bid was from Atlas Gourmet Foods for the amount of $1,650,000. The real estate policy allows the council to dispose of surplus property at market value or below if it advances the council's priorities or objectives. Therefore, Madam Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council declare the real property at 2425 Minnehaha Avenue surplus and authorize the regional administrator to quit claim the property to at last gourmet foods for $1,650,000. Thank you. There is a motion for business item 2019-69. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Your next item. Madam Chair, Council Members, business item number 2019-77, same week, is regarding a controlled access approval request by MnDOT for two projects along I-94 in the cities of Rogers, Dayton, and Maple Grove. 
This approval is needed to find that these projects are consistent with the region's transportation policy plan as required by Minnesota statute before construction begins. The projects include a new interchange along I-94 east of the current Brockton Lane overpass and added lanes along I-94 between Minnesota Highway 610 and Minnesota Highway 101 in each direction. Therefore, Madam Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council approve a request by the Minnesota Department of Transportation to add lanes along I-94 between Minnesota 610 and Minnesota 101 and construct a, a new full access interchange east of the existing Brockton Lane overpass subject to further review and approval by the Metropolitan Council if there are significant changes in the design of the proposed project. Okay, thank you. There is a motion on business item 2019-77. Is there any further discussion? Second. Uh, we had the motion to need a second. That is right. Is there a second? <laughs> second. Okay, by um, Council Member Wolf. Uh, is there any further discussion? Council Member Wolf. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Council Member Johnson was unable to be here this evening. Um, this is in her district, and she did attend the public hearing, but she had a conflict from before she ever joined the council that she wasn't able to get out of. So she asked me to express her. Uh, Apologies for not being here tonight, and also that she strongly supports this project. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The motion is adopted. Uh, your next item. Madam Chair, Council Members, business item number 2019-85, same week, is regarding Amendment 2 to the Transportation Policy Plan. This amendment amends the bold line locally preferred alternative and in Woodbury to extend the line 0.3 miles and adds a new terminus station and amends the I-94 highway reconstruction project in Maple Grove and Rogers to include general purpose lanes between Dayton Parkway and Highway 101. Policy plan amendments are required to remove or add regionally significant projects to the plan and to maintain fiscal constraint. This amendment changes the scope of two projects already in the plan. The amendment was open for public comment, comment on February 27th and closed on April 12th. A public hearing was held on April 2nd. Over 300 people engaged in some form on the projects, primary, primarily through social media and community meetings. Five formal public comments were received, two in support of the Gold Line project, two in support of the I-94 project, and one requesting information on how the council identifies transitway priorities. Therefore, Madam Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council accept the summary of public comments and adopt amendment number two to the transportation policy plan to amend the Gold Line project to extend the line and add a new station in Woodbury and amend the I-94 highway project to include general purpose lanes from Dayton Parkway to Highway 1 in Maple Grove and Rogers. Thank you. There is a motion on business item 2019-85. Is there a second? Second. Okay. There's a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The motion is passed. And last we have uh, your fourth item. Thank you, Madam Chair. And we're almost there. Um, so Madam Chair, Council Members, business item number 2019-86, same week, is regarding the amendment of the 2019 through 2022 Transportation Improvement Program to change the cost and description of MnDOT's I-94 concrete overlay project and to add an associate, associated project for temporary widening and crossovers. This amendment is needed to update the project description and the total cost of this 2020 project on I-94 between Maple Grove and Rogers. Cost estimates have increased to $124,600,000. Additional project scope includes adding rest area work and weigh in motion technology. Also needed as part of this amendment request is the addition of a new, of new 2019 project to complete temporary lane widening and crossovers prior to construction of MnDOT's I-94 project to add lanes between Highway 610 and 101. The total project cost for this new project, SP number 2780-99, is $11,300,000. The project is funded with state bonds funds. 
Therefore, Madam Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council concur with the Transportation Advisory Board action to amend the 2019 through 2022 Transportation Improvement Program to change the cost and description of MnDOT's I-94 concrete overlay project and to add an associated project for temporary widening and crossovers. Thank you. There is a motion on 2019-86. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mm -hmm. Okay. The item is passed. So thank you. Uh, next, we have two item, two business items. The first is the 2019-21 appointment to the Land Use Advisory Committee. As a chair of the Metropolitan Council, I am excited to make recommendations for appointments for all district openings on the Land Use Advisory Committee, also known as LUAC. LUAC provides advice and assistance to the Council on regional land use and comprehensive planning and in matters of metropolitan significance as requested by the Council. The Council received 53 applications for the Council's districts 1 through 16 and interviewed candidates on April 9th and 10th. The applicants represented a very strong pool of candidates of both community members and elected officials. I would also uh, like to thank Council Members Wolf, Johnson, and Lindstrom for serving on the nominating committee panel. I move that the Metropolitan Council approve the following appointments to the Land Use Advisory Committee. Um, and it's possible that some of them are might be in the audience. Okay. So I'm not going to uh, read their names. Um, I think that they have been informed. Is that correct? They have been informed. They're not okay. Second. Okay. So uh, move the approve the following appointments: District One through District Sixteen. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So it's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Okay. Uh, Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just like to say we had a tremendous slate of candidates applying for this job. It was a very hard decision to choose. Um, because the, the, there were so many qualified people. And uh, staff is reaching out to people who weren't chosen that are highly qualified to see if we can keep them active in other council activities because we don't want to lose their knowledge. Excellent. Council Member Stern. Uh, I just was looking at the list and I don't see anyone for District 2. Could you explain what the status of District 2 is? Yes, we had a question about that before uh, and that was the uh, Council Member Wolf. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. We only had one applicant from District 2, and so we're reaching out for additional applicants to, so that we can have a pool of people to interview rather than just one. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Let's see. The motion is we we just need to vote on it, correct? So all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. All right. So it passes, and we have our new uh, LUAC appointments. Uh, the second business item is 2019-92 appointments to the Metropolitan Parks and Open Space Commission. Uh, additionally, I have recommendations uh, for this commission uh, for the openings in District E, F, G, and H. The Metropolitan Parks and Open Space Commission is, helps the council develop a long-range plan and an acquisition and development program that includes funding priorities for regional parks. The council received 15 applications for four openings and interviewed candidates on April 15th. Again, we had a really strong uh, pool of candidates from each district. I'd like to thank Council Member Linnea Atnes, Atlas Ingerbertson, Council Member Francisco Gonzalez, um, current, now is it MPOS? MPOS, Chair Tony Yeruso, and Jenna Fletcher from the Trust for the Public Land serve for serving on the nominating committee. Okay. I move that the Metropolitan Council approve the following appointments to the Metropolitan Parks and Open Space Commission. Uh, it's District E, F, G, and H. Uh, so the motion is there. Is there a second? Okay. Uh, it's moved and seconded. Uh, is there any further discussion? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is carried. So I know it's been very exciting, right? And lots of meetings to appoint all these new people. And I think it's really great to see this moving forward. So thanks to everybody for their efforts and welcome to the new members. That brings us now to other business. 
Now we will hear our first information item, an overview of the public engagement plan presented by Michelle Fury. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Madam Chair and Council Members. I have um, a gift for you, copies of the public engagement plan, so I'm going to send those around for your um, reference. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come tonight and tell you a little bit about our public engagement plan, um, which really serves as the overarching policy for our public engagement work. Um, my goal tonight is to make sure that um, we give you some basics about how we created this plan and the um, roots of it are really in Thrive MSP 2040, so I'll spend a little bit of time on that, how that all came to be. And then to talk a little bit about um, how this plays out in our work from formal you know, engagement, things like public hearings to um, what's really more community-based engagement to make sure that we're getting the right voices to your decision-making processes to make sure that you're supported and that you get the information you need. And before we conclude today, we'll um, have a couple of things for you to think about as we move forward. Um, this plan, as you'll see, uh, was first uh, initiated and we've been using it since uh, September 2015. So it is probably due for a little bit of a refresh. So we'll be uh, looking at some uh, topics for a discussion there as well. So Thrive MSP 2040, um, as I mentioned, the roots for this public engagement plan really came from the process to create our regional plan. And the, the process for that last regional plan was pretty extensive in terms of making sure that we heard from the range of people who were interested in uh, what, our, what our long range plan was for this region. Um, and there were many, 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 many organizations that came both to the council here in this room and presented to the group um, in the Committee of the Whole format, but also many stakeholders externally that were involved in, in small group discussions, large scale meetings that involved, um, you know, various topics and were really actively involved in, in the Thrive process. It was more than 2,000 people were actually involved in that process. And that may not seem like a very big number of people, but when you're talking about a, a long-term plan that's way up here, it's it's definitely a thing that, you know, isn't isn't creating controversy on, on the street in front of people's houses, right? So it's, it's a little bit more difficult to get people involved. But one of the things that um, we heard certainly, and, and the, the Thrive outcomes are all in front of you, and um, if, if Libby Starling was here to talk about this, she would say that they all need to live in balance with one another. So um, I, will, I will continue to channel that, but the, the point is that there are so many different um, interests that we're, we're weighing when we're talking about regional policy that they all need to sort of live in harmony. Um, and there are certainly ways that, that they, they balance each other out. But um, one of the other things that was significantly different about this whole process is what people in this region really wanted to see in the plan. It was the idea was that it's a really truly a regional plan as opposed to just the council's sort of vision for development in the region moving forward. Um, and as a result of that, we had a lot of people involved. And um, the equity outcome is the one that I'll talk most about today because that is the piece where um, the public engagement aspects really play themselves out. So uh, one of the things that we heard from people was that we needed to change the way we involve the public and stakeholders in our decision making, not just at the regional planning level, but throughout all of the different things that we do here at the council. And um, that came through loud and clear in that time MSP 2040 process. It also came through loud and clear with a couple of cross-sector um, uh, collaborations that the council was involved with. One of them was called Quarters of Opportunity, which was um, part of a uh, sustainable communities grant that came from the federal government and also leveraged a lot of private um, philanthropy to really um, see the discussion around engagement and transit development um, and, and uh, development generally. And because there were so many people from different sectors coming together, they, they recognized the value of all those different voices at the table in decision making. And the, the power of that actually transcended that effort. It lasted many years after that. And, and there are certainly still relationships that are leveraged as a result of those conversations. And the other thing that we heard loud and clear was that we really needed to focus on the impact on people in the region and not just things, right? When we, when we plan, we talk a lot about things. We talk a lot about facilities um, when we mean roads and bridges and transit, right? But they're, they're things. So we, we need to reinvigorate the conversations with the, with the um, perspectives of people and the voices of people. 
Um, so ultimately, you know, engagement, we, we also started to um, shift our language away from outreach to engagement because engagement connotates a two-way relationship where you're actually having some give and take in your conversations and the decisions are shared decisions for the good of the region and the people in the region and and though you are all the policymakers that are making those decisions ultimately you want to hear how that's going to impact the people in the region as well that really um, that really changed through this process and we we made the um, specific reference to the fact that engagement needs to support the policy making, right? That it can't just be, um, it can't just be because we have to do it or because it's a thing that's coming along. It, it actually needs to answer critical questions that the policy makers need to know, and it, it needs to identify the key issues that are, are pervasive in the in the marketplace of ideas. So um, some of the specific things that we learned are that we need to value experience and expertise. And that's not just from people who are paid to come before us all the time to, to be a part of those decisions, but there are lived experiences of people in the region that matter in the decisions that we make. Um, we need to meet people where they are. So we need to not assume they can come to a meeting at four o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon, but there are other times when we need to make sure that they're able to participate in processes. And often that looks very different for different groups of people. Um, we need to show the value of participation, meaning this is uh, something that people are willing to spend their valuable time, which is a precious resource to all of us in, in doing. Um, we need to plan with constituents and not just for them, and that is certainly more complicated than you know than it, than in the in the past eras we've done. But it um, it does make the the vision then something that we can all own and all support. Um, that goes along with sharing <coughs> the setting. So when you have an idea around what um, what a project needs to do and be, it isn't just the organizational point of view; it's also the community point of view. Um, we should expect collaboration and build capacity when we're doing engagement. So we're not just expecting people to show up and tell us things, but we're recognizing that they can learn and grow. And especially when you're partnering with community organizations, recognizing that it's not just for the benefit of the council, but it's for the benefit of, of the people that they represent in those organizations as well. And then the last piece, and this is something that I say a lot, so you might hear me say it again, um, authentic engagement really does take time. And sometimes our timelines are not long enough to really get deep into some of the issues that we need to, that we need to understand. But that doesn't mean that we aren't building on something. So if, if there is a time limited um, situation where a decision absolutely needs to be made on a certain timeline, that the, um, it's important to be at least aware and flexible in terms of the long-term conversation that there's always somewhere we can grow from something and when we might decide something on a particular day we still um, have other things that we can address down the road um, one of the things that we heard a lot about um, from community folks who both participated in the quarters of opportunity project as well as a handful of um, capital projects that were going on at the time including the construction of the green line was that um, Trust is something that is, is an ongoing relationship, that you have to be constantly nurturing that trust and nurturing that, um, that expectation. And, and it's, it's one thing to be an organization and, and be dealing with people, but it's another thing to actually authentically try to uh, note that that is a, a long-term conversation. And one of the things that we are, are constantly thinking about as an organization is how do we balance um, garnering attention for decision making and for engagement with those those authentic relationships and connections. So we might not be talking every day about being out in community and meeting with people, but at the same time, we are out constantly meeting with people and so are you and those relationships matter too. So being able to leverage all of those things without constantly having to say, you know, this is a promotional opportunity as opposed to just a relationship building opportunity. So as I mentioned, this all came out of the Thrive 2040 uh, equity outcome. And this is the specific um, text from the document that calls for engaging a full cross-section of the community in decision-making and then officially creating a council-wide public engagement plan. So this was all happening concurrently with the Quarters of Opportunity Project, and we were hearing from community in both of those processes. Um, there was another thing that was also going on at the time that I'll just speak about briefly um, in a minute, um, that was a, a little bit of a um, 
it was an ad hoc committee that was created by Chair Susan Haig at the time to go a little bit more deeply into some of the operational practices around engagement and our advisory committees here at the council. So all of those things came together and we agreed that there were, there were critical things that we needed to create and, and just solidify in a document so that we knew what our values were moving forward. Um, and that really did reflect a new approach to engagement. And as I mentioned, there were the, this came out of the Quarters of Opportunity and the Thrive Project, but um, there is a group of community organizations that were part of that Quarters of Opportunity Project called the Community Engagement Steering Committee. They still meet. Um, they, are, uh, they were initially created to disperse grant funds that was part of that Quarters of Opportunity Project, but they have really been thought leaders around engagement in the region and have provided a lot of pretty critical information to not just the council, but to governments across the region as well. And they're really partners in community with, um, with the council in these conversations. So the, as I mentioned, uh, Chair Susan Haig created this ad hoc committee in 2013 that um, asked three criti critical questions. Um, what changes do we need to make to our public engagement practices? How do we diversify our advisory committees and make sure that there are um, more voices uh, from across the region and in those processes? And then should we create an equity advisory committee? And that group met off and on for a little over um, a year and a half and ultimately decided that some of the concurrent conversations that we're having with the public engagement plan should be um, implemented at the council. Um, how to diversify advisory committees included um, recruiting differently and um, creating some of the processes that you all have been experiencing this time around, with, which are a little bit more intentionally um, uh, targeting uh, the different groups of the different community organizations ahead of a full recruitment so that we know where we might actually get some um, good candidates from. And then, um, of course, in 2015, the council created an equity advisory committee, which still operates today. Um, when the council decided that we needed to create the the public engagement plan, we actually began meeting with community organizations and that community engagement steering committee um, to first sort through some of the things that had not gone well in their points of view for many months. And then um, to really create a shared definition of engagement and to create some shared principles for engagement. So if you um, if you pull out your public <laughs> and open to the middle, it's really conveniently located. There is um, a double page spread that, that identifies the key public engagement principles and talks a little bit about some of these definitions. And these principles were um, created concurrently by the council members at the time and the members of this um, local uh, community organizations and, and engagement professionals that we got together. So there were concurrent conversations and in some cases collaborative conversations to create all of these principles. So I think there's tremendous power in having a public engagement policy that has community voices embedded in it. They were involved in writing this, they were involved in um, elevating these principles and in really defining what they all mean um, in a way that is, is pretty, um, I mean, it's certainly practical and, and useful and we found it very um, helpful in, in focusing our work. But the fact that all the policymakers at the council level and the, these community representatives all agreed that these were the principles for engagement is, is something that we're really grateful for having that opportunity to have that conversation. If you have any questions about the specific principles themselves, I certainly can answer those questions, but I just wanted you to know that that was something that happened collaboratively. Um, as you see, I'm just running through them. Um, the equity, respect, transparency, relevance, accountability, collaboration, inclusion, and cultural competence. The idea behind all of these things, of course, is, is to um, elevate the things that we, the lenses that we should be looking through as we um, plan engagement and um, execute engagement. But ultimately, it's there are a handful of um, there are a handful of things that also respond to the feedback that we heard from all of the folks that participated in the Thrive process and the Quarters of Opportunity. It really encapsulates where the issues were and where the focus needs to be moving forward. Um, so the idea behind the public engagement plan is that it supports the work that we do and the decisions that the council members and the advisory committees make. Um, 
this is how it plays out in our work. We have project-based engagement. So things like um, the, uh, the uh, transportation policy plan amendment that you all approved today, um, that is project-based engagement. And there are federal and state or regulations that govern the work that we do when we amend the transportation policy plan. So we dedicate time and effort to making sure that those things happen. And the, the transportation policy plan is a great example of a more formal process where we have to have a public hearing, a public comment process, and then all of the uh, information gets put into a report and brought to you for consideration. Um, there's long-term policy development. So all of the council policy documents have a similarly um, formal process that they that they um, all undergo. So the transportation policy plan, drive MSP 2040, the housing policy plan, the water resources policy plan, the regional parks policy plan, and to some degree the water um, water supply plan uh, all go through this process. Um, we have chosen to make some consistency decisions about those processes. So they all have public hearings. They all have formal public comment processes. But many years before those documents are put together, we actually are engaging stakeholders in what the policy should look like. That is something that all council members get involved with as well. So it is not like we just write the plan, send it out, and have the formal public processes. We actually make sure that stakeholders in the community and in the industry, in the case of housing or transportation, for example, are all a part of those conversations as well. There is usually a critical involvement with the advisory committees as well. So for the transportation policy plan, for example, the transportation advisory board is a critical partner in making that happen. For the parks policy plan, the Parks and Open Space Commission is a critical partner. So those advisory committees play a pretty um, important role in making sure that the stakeholders are engaged and that there are regular updates about the, um, the progress that's being made on that long-term policy development. As I mentioned, there are formal processes and in addition to this public engagement plan, we have some administrative processes and policies that govern the public hearings that we have, for example, um, with time to make sure that we are able to um, notice those meetings and inform the public about them. Um, and that really involves things like public hearings or open houses or things like that. But we're really striving to do more than just those formal engagements around our processes and really try to make sure that we're having conversations with stakeholders that are either traditionally not a part of our planning processes or are otherwise affected by the processes. And one of these things that, um, that one of the things that you'll see in the public engagement plan is an acknowledgement that um, when you're planning engagement for community, you need to make sure you know how they want to be engaged in a question. So don't just assume that they want a series of open houses if they really can't attend those open houses. Make sure that that you're actually plugging into the affected parties with your planning process before you even go out and do that engagement. So um, that is one of the other things that we've been trying to do in an ongoing way is to make sure that we're strategically reaching out, building relationships with uh, both organizations, but um, uh, members of community or uh, aspects of community so that we are prepared to ask questions, especially if we don't have a whole lot of time. I'll give you an example. Um, Last, or it's been more than, it's been almost two years now, um, we were aware that we were going to need to create some additional revenue and raise transit fares. No one really was happy about the idea that we were going to have to discuss that very issue because it's, it's a difficult issue. It's something that has impact on people. Um, we didn't have a whole lot of time to do a lot of engagement, but the time that we did have, we could plug into existing relationships. And um, one of the things that we had the, the, uh, advantage of was we've been running a pilot program uh, for this transit assistant pro assistance program, which was for um, low income fare or, uh, uh, fares for uh, qualifying low income riders. And because we've been doing the pilot project with community organizations for quite a long time, we were able to reach back out to those folks and say, we need to do some more intentional engagement here to make sure that we're asking the right questions of some of the communities that are going to be most affected by this decision. And we were able to get incredible penetration in that market, as well as um, do a survey that we almost got, um, we got more than 1,600 responses for in the, in the course of a very quick time frame. Um, and it was because of those um, pieces of feedback that we actually had really good information for the policymakers to, to decide about that, 
that program and to have a little bit more um, tools in the box when it came to mitigating some of the impacts of that fear increase. So that was something that because we had existing relationships, we could tap into those and actually move fairly quickly, even though we certainly would have liked more time to have that long-term discussion. Um, the other thing that I wanted to highlight for you is we are looking for opportunities to provide additional guidance for staff related to um, certain key constituencies. So one of the things we did when we created this public engagement plan was we, um, we worked with a consulting uh, firm, uh, Grassroots Solutions here in town to, to create some best practice strategies for implementing this plan. And so that give, they've given us a lot of tools to use um, that, that have been uh, fairly well used as, as we've been rolling all of this out. But we are coming in contact with, with new situations where we, we don't necessarily need a wholesale new policy, but we do need guidance for staff related to reaching certain communities. Um, one of those things is uh, related to tribal consultation. So you may have noticed that um, a couple weeks ago, the governor signed an executive order related to um, tribal consultation and the council is included in that executive order. So we are now going to have to create a formal policy around that. But we have been working for the past three years to develop relationships with um, tribal communities to begin that process already. So we have a lot of information that we've been gathering from tribal leaders, and we can bring that to bear on this broader um, conversation related to the policy, but also provide really specific guidance for staff about how they can implement that policy. And that will be something that we'll be discussing in the, in the coming months as we, as we put some of those materials together. Um, then the, the last thing that I will uh, mention, and this is a little bit trickier, but you know, as an organization that values data and that uh, values um, accountability as it relates to how we're doing and uh, measuring the impact of the work that we do, uh, we're implementing um, various methods to measure the impact of our engagement. And uh, it's not quite a quantitative function like you would expect a lot of this to be. It's not just about counting people or meetings or the things that we've been able to do. It's really about measuring how um, participants in the process felt about um, the way that their participation influenced the ultimate decision, whether they were respected, some of the principles that you saw on the screen before. Was it transparent? Did they understand how they could affect the ultimate decision? Did they feel included and did they feel respected in that process? Things like that. So we're regularly, when we have engagement, um, asking those questions of participants and as a continuous improvement process, rolling that right back into our processes moving forward. So when we hear that something worked or didn't, we're adjusting to make sure that we're um, being conscious of that going forward. Um, I will uh, only mention one additional thing that has also been a fairly new phenomenon um, and is something that we like to do when we can, um, and that's um, put resources directly in the community to support engagement. So um, over the course of the last couple of years, we've been partnering with uh, MnDOT on the I-94 project where they're rethinking the um, the corridor and you know, looking at some long-term improvements, particularly through the central cities. Um, I probably don't have to tell you the impact that um, uh, constructing that highway had on the communities um, that it went through. Um, as a result of that um, legacy, we wanted to make sure that there were some intentional um, choices being made to, to support community and having a conversation about the impact of a highway like that when it goes through that. Um, uh, you know, MnDOT may be concerned about the surface that you know, people are driving on, but the council has a little bit more of a broader interest in community impact and livability issues. So we wanted to make sure that we uh, spent plenty of time talking about some of those things. And um, we were able to provide uh, contracts for uh, engagement to six community organizations as part of that process. So we were spending our money in a way that um, lifted up the voices of the organizations in that corridor and brought really interesting and important um, points of view, not only to the council, but to the MnDOT process as they're prioritizing how they're going to spend resources <laughs> on that roadway as well. So that's that's a piece that is um, also noted in this engagement plan and has been something that we've been able to do in the past few years. 
with that, I will stop talking and ask if you have any questions of me. Um, the other thing that I will say while you're thinking about your questions is um, if there are specific issues that you are interested in exploring more as it relates to this plan, um, I would love to hear from you. I know Meredith would love to hear from you. Um, and we've been thinking about some ways that we can engage you in the refresh of the plan. So um, that will be information that will come to you, but I'm, I'm very open and interested in your ideas as well. Thank you. Thank you. Good presentation. Can you tell us, give us a couple examples of the I-94 grants and what they did? Um, we certainly, Madam Chair, um, Council Members, we supported um, some uh, pop-up meetings and um, neighborhood conversations in uh, the Union Park District Council, which is, uh, for lack of a better, it's, it's sort of by um, Snelling and um, I'm trying to think, I think it goes all the way over to Lexington, but kind of in that area along the highway where they talked about um, access to the roadway and the impact on the surrounding community of traffic and things like that. So um, the district council in that community um, sponsored conversations around those issues and collected data from, from residents and, and provided that as part of the project. Um, we also had, um, we provided some money to Hope Community um, in Minneapolis for some organizing around um, the impact of construction on local communities. And they had some really amazing conversations. I would love to talk to you more about that, but um, really amazing conversations because while the the immediate work was about the I-94 project. The um, 35W project was actually happening at the time that they were having these conversations. So there was some really relevant experience that they were talking about right then. So um, the impact of construction, they had community conversations, they had some um, art installations where they had people expressing themselves that way. Um, but it was really, really um, uh, just like eye-opening uh, experiences. And I think that the, the Minot staff would say the same. And we had a, we had a, an event at the end of the project where we had every um, one of the vendors that were part of this process present their findings and the MnDOT staff were present as well. And they, um, they were really grateful for the opportunity to learn from the experiences of the community organization. Okay, one quick follow-up and then we'll move to member questions. So what were the size of the grants? Um, we had a total of $178,000, so they ranged from um, $10,000 to $35,000, and they were different for each organization. We had a, a competitive bidding process, so they submitted their projects, and they were evaluated. Um, the evaluation panel was MnDOT staff, council staff, and community members who were all part of the process of looking at those projects and deciding generally how much money to give each one, but the, the projects themselves requested the money that they needed to do the um, to do the studies that they wanted to do. Thank you. So on the list so far, I have uh, Council Member Lee and then Council Member Lilligren, if you want to get on the list, uh, Liz is making one. So Council Member Lee. Well, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for all the work that you and your team and department does. Um, on your page uh, four slide, at the top there of what you learned, um, I just want to, I, first I have a comment and a question. My comment is that I um, really appreciate you highlighting the communities, um, valuing the community members' experiences and expertise. Um, as a child of refugees, as soon as I could uh, command the English language cognitively, when I was five or six, I began interpreting for my parents at my own parent conferences, um, interpreting to navigate the welfare system that kind of lived experience, I can, I can never trade for a PhD in public policy. And we have to remember to, um, to appreciate that kind of lived experience in, in community members. And so my question to you is what, what are we doing to ensure that all of our staff members um, who interface with the public and in engagement uh, appreciate that and that they're truly ready to receive feedback um, and engagement from the public? Ms. Fury. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member and Madam Chair. Yeah, um, so, the, of course, one of the criteria that we have when we, um, when we put people in place to do engagement is that they understand the, the value of the people that they're interacting with. So that's one of the, is it, from a professional um, point of view, that's an expectation. That if you're going out to talk to the public, that you need to respect the, the um, expertise that they bring. Um, that being said, we're also um, putting things into place to have more of an ongoing training not just for the, the core outreach staff that are going out, but for others who are regularly interacting with the public so that they can have a little bit more um, 
sense of comfort going in front of folks because it, it can be a, a pretty intimidating process. But um, ultimately, we want to make sure that we're building those skills so that people are, are becoming more adept and more comfortable with that. Um, it's it's a difficult thing to do, but it is certainly um, a key priority for us to make sure that we're training our staff and, and making sure that they know that and that they under, understand that sensibility. Thank you. Council Member Lilligren. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Fury, thanks for the report and for your for your work on this. And I have a, a question around the new guidance on tribal consultation. And I'm just wondering, I know it's new, very new, and so I'm wondering what kind of thought has been given to the impact of the guidance on the region where there are no tribes and mm -hmm. there is no tribal land or tribal nations. Ms. Fury? So, Madam Chair and Council Member, I appreciate the question. That's a pretty critical piece. Um, one of the things that we've already been talking about, largely from the feedback that we've gotten from um, folks who we've already consulted with in, in creating some of the um, guidance that we've, we've been working on, is that there's really these two areas of importance. One is the <coughs> formal role, where if you have property and you are part of a you know, federally recognized tribe, then you have standing as a member of that nation. That is, that is relevant in the metro area, but it is um, not is only relevant in parts of the metro area. There are many, many um, folks who are indigenous and Native American who live in the region and they need to be consulted in a way that is meaningful, right? So we're gonna have both of those things addressed in this, in this guidance um, and, and making sure that we understand from a cultural perspective how we do that, right? Um, so I think that's pretty critical to make sure that we're not just limiting ourselves to the to the tribes that are in the region, but also the people that live here and making sure that they have um, the opportunity to participate as well. And in a way that is meaningful to them, not just a way that is easy for us. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's very encouraging, uh, Ms. Free, uh, of a response to acknowledge that with the 11 federally recognized tribes within the state of Minnesota, there are many, many times that uh, uh, tribal representation within the population of the region. And in summer, the city of Minneapolis, for example, has memos of understanding, memos of agreement mm -hmm. with the, the Native community that acknowledges exactly that point that you just raised and establishes a framework for uh, more formal interaction, more formal engagement between the community. And so I'm very interested in being part of this conversation as it goes on and, and, uh, and supporting your efforts. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Just to, to that point, uh, Councilmember Lilligren, I'm, I'm also very interested in the, the feedback from the members and uh, as we move towards our retreat and potentially break up into some kind of work groups, this would potentially be one. So everybody right. can kind of think of there could be a couple topics uh, we talk about and that you're interested they could sign up and uh, I don't know exactly what we're going to call them ad hoc or work groups, but um, we want people to be able to work on um, some of these issues, right? Uh, it's really important. We also, uh, it, it affects some of our upcoming lines that we're working on, mm -hmm. the River View Corridor, mm -hmm. for example. So, good points. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Council Member Gonzalez. Thank you, Ma uh, Madam Chairman. Um, thank you for the, the effort that you're doing on this uh, project. I really appreciate it. Um, just thinking of my own experience in doing engagement with communities that have traditionally be, uh, have been disenfranchised or have, have lack access to circles of power. And one of the things that we always found is if we are going to talk to a community about a specific issue, uh, help. <coughs> and we have community members bringing other issues that are not even remotely related to health. Um, that's an opportunity to have engagement and, and to uh, bring, have them have ownership uh, in the process. If they feel that we're listening to them on things that are not related to the Met Council's mission, but then we also need to do something with that information. Um, for example, in my own experiences, if they were bringing issues that were absolutely outside of the purview of the organization that I was working with them, my standard response would be, thank you, and I will forward your concerns to X, Y, Z, and I will let you know what they tell me about your concern. Not that you need to do that work, but that we are uh, listening and actually acting on their concerns on those. <coughs> Is that part of the engagement that you've thought about and, and, and how is that going to work on, as you move forward with this program? 
Ms. Fury. Chair, Council Member, and thank you for uh, noting that. That is a pretty critical value of any um, government organization, in my opinion, that, that just because we don't do the thing doesn't mean we can't forward on critical feedback to that other organization. We all know who does what, like we know, and we just need to be um, good neighbors, really, and connecting folks to the right resources. So when staff hear these things, we're definitely encouraging them to connect with the right organization, but to also hear it and to be present and to um, use that information to the extent that we need to, because we can always learn from something that someone says. Um, I would also say that um, we often, especially when we're just building relationships, go to an organization or to a group or to even people, a handful of people, um, and ask them what they need from the partnership, as well as, you know, talk about something that we might be looking for long term, but we often go to them before we actually have an ask. And it will be either in an opportunity to um, inform them about how the transit system works or to provide general information about something that we know about or bring other partners from government along just to make sure that we're lending value to them before we're actually asking them to do something for us. So as much as we can do that, we try to do that ahead of time, just because of what you say, that it's not just about the thing that we need. It's also about um, just, you know, creating better understanding about how government works. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Atlas Ingebrigtsen. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, and a couple of, I, I have a lot, so I'll email you, you guys later. Right? <laughs> Um, but a couple of things I really um, want to recognize um, what I'm guessing is some of the work that the building the field work that Nexus community partners um, contributed to this in the understanding of the difference between outreach and engagement. So I'm really <clears throat> glad to see that in here. Um, I think this is a very important piece to have. Um, I also want to recognize that policy and guidelines um, get us so far. They're an essential building block and a first step, but it really comes down to um, practice and culture of an organization to bring these things to life. Um, so uh, with that in mind, I think as you go further into this more authentic approach to engagement, you'll start to experience things like um, and I think that Council Member Gonzalez was getting to this engagement fatigue or the perception of extraction of expertise and knowledge without um, reciprocal, truly reciprocal relationships in communities. Um, another thing that I think we are already experiencing to some extent in my very humble 45-ish days, is that where we are on the job? <laughs> Technically, maybe, <laughs> something like that. Um, is the need to just also thought, think about the intersection between communication strategy and engagement. The things that I think could really um, aid us in this is incorporating um, some of the practices of the spectrum from the International Association of Public Participation. I've shared this with staff. I think it's just really helpful for us to coordinate on communication between what we're saying and the messages staff are supporting with us or even, even just between staff and our body. Um, so that we're coordinating and having clarity and a stronger commitment um, communicated to us or that we can then share out with the community um, with clear ways of how people can stay informed, learn about the impact they've had on a decision or something we're forming, um, and that we can then deliver on those promises or those commitments we're making. Um, and then that is how I think we build a more authentic long-term piece. I think the power of this is also in that many of our public partners, the county, the state, many <coughs> departments, most of the cities are using this approach. So if we do that, we're amplifying their um, approach, they're amplifying ours, and people sometimes have a hard time knowing where does the Met Council stop <laughs> and begin, and where does the city or the county or something like that. I think we can just grow, kind of join that larger um, group. So I hope that's something um, that would be helpful um, and that we can think about incorporating. I have actually heard some staff start to use this language, and it was really nice. It really clarified things. I think of it for transportation folks like a road diet. It just helps to organize things so they think they, they uh, flow smoothly. The last thing I would just say is that I'd encourage us to think and push ourselves to understand that we can always have measurable specific metrics as it relates to 
engagement. And the thing that you mentioned that made me think of this specifically was the need to expand cultural competency um, here. I think the way that we do that, and I think the way that we also have truly reciprocal relationships with our communities is to make sure that they're represented in our staff, that they're represented on our commissions and on our councils and on our various boards. And to do that, we need to take a look at the processes by which they get there. And we need to equally value um, people who bring in diverse networks as a hard skill and expertise and talent, just like it takes other things to do job to do jobs and that it shouldn't just be something that lives with the engagement people. And when you need that, you call the engagement people or you reach out to that community group. But that, that is the, that's the future for us. Every job needs to have that as a core um, competency and we should be measuring that and not just in hiring, but in performance reviews and opportunities for promotions. Thank you. Are there any other questions, comments? Sorry. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks for your great work. The question I have, uh, how diverse our outreach team is? And uh, and I, I, I'm just also curious, how many languages do they speak? Just to you know see their competency with dealing with immigrant community. Ms. Fury. Um, Madam Chair, Council Member, so the, um, the team here at the um, a regional administration that supports the long range policy. Um, we have um, one non English speaker who is bilingual and she um, she speaks Spanish as well as English and she uh, regularly uh, corresponds with others in in Spanish. It's actually kind of fun to listen to or talk to people on the phone. Um, and we also have access to um, throughout the council um, non, -ish, non English speakers who help us with uh, materials and in some cases planning. So these aren't necessarily outreach staff, but they are people who um, represent, you know, other, certainly other points of view, but are also non-English speakers, um, which is super helpful. Um, we have previously had others who speak a language other than English, but currently at this time, we only have one um, that who is, who is bilingual. Um, there are other teams throughout the council, the Metro Transit team, the team at the um, project offices, and then um, staff who are, are supporting programs specifically who are also not English speakers. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I'd say between a quarter and a third of those people um, represent people who have uh, second language uh, experience, but are also um, culturally diverse. Okay. Uh, Council Member, uh, are you finished, Council Member Lucy? Yeah. Okay. Council Member Atlas, Engelbertson, and then Ferguson. Just a quick follow-up on that question. I want to make sure I understood the response accurately. So are you saying that we have non-translation interpretation staff who are not a part of the engagement team who are providing translation and interpretation services um, um, that are, is not a part of their role? Uh, no, Councilmember okay. and um, Madam Chair, the, um, these would be people that we consult with as we are planning. If we need um, translation and interpretation services. We contract those. We have a uh, regular, a uh, handful of regular vendors that we use to do those, um, to do those, and to perform those services um, for either in-person events or um, for materials that we need to have translated. Um, like. The other, but the thing that they do help us with in some cases is checking the accuracy, accuracy of those translations. So like there, there are specific terms that the council uses that are not generally easy to understand. The term equity, for example, almost always gets translated in a financial sense as opposed to um, in terms of you know, cultural uh, identity. Um, so we sometimes have them double check that stuff for us or do a plain language review before we send it out for translation because they have expertise in a second language. That And uh, that's the consulting, the consultants do that. The staff do that, uh, perform that informal role for us as we're getting ready to do the, con uh, to hire consultants to do translation and interpretation. Okay. I can talk to you more about how that actually works. It's, it's merely a, an extra check that we have to make sure that um, we're not doing something that would be either completely misunderstood or inappropriate in terms of um, how we make sure that if uh, something needs to be translated or otherwise interpreted in second language that it's, it's clear. Okay, and I'm gonna go to Council Member Ferguson and then if I don't see any other hands or Liz doesn't, uh, then we're gonna move on to our next item. Council Member Ferguson. Uh, so just one, I guess, maybe final thought. I uh, served on the Quarters of Opportunity Policy Board. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that was interesting when I first presented to it before I was on the policy board, I think there was only one person of color out of the 30 or 40 people on the board. And then we actually, Rapa 
and, and others uh, joined the board. So that was sort of the beginning of that learning process was that even the group that was supposed to be thinking about um, this change was not diverse in itself. But one of the things that, you know, we at that group talked a lot about the disparities and the challenges that we have as a region. Most of those numbers haven't changed. So I think we should look at engagement as, as, as a step in the process to having better outcomes in the region as opposed to being excited about having better engagement. Mm -hmm. Because if we have better engagement and yet the numbers don't move, and we still have huge disparity gaps, in fact, they're getting worse, um, then maybe our engagement's not really what, working the way we want it to work. Because ultimately, uh, the goal of the work that we all do is to make those disparities um, smaller and make our economy stronger and, and move people forward. So um, I would say that someone who served in that original group, <coughs> one of my frustrations, as I look back 10 years now, that really, you know, for all the work that was done, really, the numbers haven't moved, and, and that's highly frustrating. Thank you. Ms. Fury, any response? Or? Okay. Well, I think that's a fair assessment, that it absolutely needs to point to outcomes, and um, if we're not really doing that, then we need to sit back and think, think should we be doing it instead? Yeah, I think, you know, I think, members, this is a big, big topic, right? And I think it's something we're all really, really interested in, so as we move forward, you know, we need to work with the regional administrator and with the staff and try to figure out how we can move the needle on this. And um, I think we've all been um, involved in um, community engagement. And honestly, I mean, some of the things, we have a couple lines out in the East Metro and, you know, the pop-ups and stuff just don't quite do it, right? It's, it's not enough. And so I think, uh, you know, but you're doing a lot of good work. You've done a lot of good work. Uh, but there's more good work to do, and I think we, we definitely want to have the council involved in that. So, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. All right. Uh, next, we will have our final item is the introduction to Equal Opportunity Council Equity Overview presented by the director, Sarenthia Jordan, and staff. Welcome to the council. Now, I just want to give the members a heads up. Uh, RA, is this about an hour long or so? Um, I would defer to uh, Cy Jordan. It's about, I think, 40-ish slides, and so uh, that depends on yes. any questions okay. you all have as well. So we we'll try to get through it. You know, I still like to try to get through the presentation because often the questions people are asking are in there, but uh, just so you know, it'll be a, we want to listen carefully, and I, I noticed one of the members noted the page um, that, that the question was on. Uh, so what I'd like to do is try to to get through it and then have a really good discussion afterwards. So, welcome. Thank you, Chair. And so we will be mindful of time and try to get through our slides, not rush through them, but we have worked through to make sure that we are moving forward quickly through the slides and we'll leave some opportunity for questions. And so, um, again, my name is Cy Jordan. I am the Director of Equal Opportunity. This is the first time we've come before the full council, and so I want to give you just a brief overview of the services that our office provide. And again, I'll be very brief. I'm not going to go through each of the duties, but be specific in the areas that are not presenting before you today. So we've broken down our presentation into three additional areas. One would be the small business unit. They'll speak specifically to their DBE involvement and then more broadly around MCUB. And then they'll also talk about um, some of the general work that they're doing and moving forward. With our uh, third presentation, it's going to be the light rail transit unit, and they also heavily are engaged in DBE specific <laughs> to the light rail, and they'll talk briefly about that. And then we'll have an overview of our equity work. Certainly, we'll have opportunity to come before the council in the future and also present um, individually. We do have some written responses that we're currently engaged in providing to council members as well at this time. And so with that, I won't go through each of the first few slides. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to understand the structure of our Equal Opportunity Office and our roles that we provide. And so we have currently 17 active staff and one of which is um, funded through the uh, Southwest, uh, through the uh, project office actually for the Southwest Light Rail project. And with that, we have uh, four broad units. We have our small business unit, we have our light rail transit unit, we also have our investigation resolution unit, and then our equity unit. We provide roughly eight uh, overarching areas of services. We are at our base compliance focus, and we provide services around our ADA work for accessibility for actual physical structures 
and um, programs and services. We provide Title VI planning. We also provide, um, through our small business unit, they'll talk more about our compliance that we do in certifications. But in addition to that, we have our internal MCUB program. And then with our light rail office, again, it is uh, the DBE services for that specific uh, project that is currently active. With our investigation resolution unit, we um, have a broad range of services that involve internal and external actual um, investigations around discrimination and harassment policy. We provide affirmative action planning. We also um, go through some very detailed work around resolution throughout the council, consultations around employee accommodations. We provide services for the public as well as internally. And so those are the highlights of those areas. We, in addition, have our um, business analyst that supports our unit as well. Because this is the first time that we're coming before the full council and our um, staff are located in various offices around the region, they're here at Robert Street, but they're also in Minneapolis at the Haywood office. They're in um, St. Louis Park as well as Gold Valley. They, those who could be here today are here, so I want them to stand up and be able um, to be visible. So those from the uh, small business unit, if you could please stand. And from our light rail unit is not here. From our investigation resolution unit, well, actually we do have a light rail here. <laughs> our investigation resolution unit, and then we have our equity unit that is here as well. I don't know that I missed anybody. So I wanted them to be at least visible to you and certainly they will be reachable to the councils. We have our individual meetings with members as well. With that, I'm going to have Tracy, not Tracy, I'm gonna have Elaine come up who is a supervisor of our small business unit. Oh, we'll by Tracy too, that's okay. Chair, council members, uh, good afternoon, early evening, I guess. Thank you for allowing, allowing us to be here. I'm excited to talk a little bit about our two small business programs that the council manages. Um, everything that the small business unit does is basically dictated by the policies, procedures, process, goals that we have around these two small business programs. Uh, I'm going to touch briefly about the two, two programs and describe the differences between the two. Um, first of all, the, the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program, DBE, which many of you know, is our federally mandated program. It applies to all contracts, procurements that are federally assisted. The Metropolitan Council Underutilized Business Program, MCUB, you'll hear that acronym a lot. That is the um, Metropolitan Council's own small business program that applies to anything that is locally funded. Both programs, the goal, uh, they strive to ensure an equitable, equitable participation of minority women and underutilized businesses in council projects and procurements. And again, both are distinctly different, basically um, by their funding source. DBE is federal, MCOB is strictly local. DBE, I'm just going to uh, touch base on DBE real quick just to give you an idea of what that program looks like. Again, the DBE program applies to anything that is FTA assisted and also uh, would be anything that the funds through that come from EPA that funnel through PFA, the Public Facilities Authority. Uh, DBE applies to, to those projects as well. My team uh, does a little bit of everything in terms of um, certification and compliance. <coughs> in terms of certification, we, my staff reviews, processes, and certifies DBE firms on an annual, or regularly on an annual basis. We certify probably about 50, 50 firms a year. Obviously, there's more firms that are certified than that, but it's in partnership with four other agencies. So my staff alone will process approximately, approximately that many. We also set contract specific goals on our projects. Uh, DBE goals are applicable to procurements that are both federally assisted over $50,000 and have subcontracting opportunities. On any given day, my team manages uh, compliance on 
approximately 100 FTA or, or EPA assisted contracts. That's not including the locally funded ones. Just to touch base on the triennial goals that are set for the DBE program, again, this is a requirement through the program that we must set a, a triennial goal on, on both the FTA funded and EPA funded. Uh, right now, our goals for or our goal for FTA funded contracts for the uh, 2017 through two, 2020 triennium is 15 percent. We're on track to meet that according to the numbers uh, through 2018. Our EPA goal is 14%, and again, we're on track to meet that. This process of setting those triennial goals um, starts uh, approximately six, six to eight months before they're actually due. We start collecting the data, so uh, in probably February of 2020, we'll start collecting data, uh, analyzing it, and uh, trying to come up with a goal that we'll set for the next triennium. That will come before the council probably in July, for approval or further discussion. And next I'm gonna to touch base on MCUB and go into a lot more detail about this program because it is a, a um, council-based program that we have a lot of efforts that we've, we've put toward recently. Uh, the MCUB is, again, it stands for Met Council Underutilized Business Program, was created to create a level playing field for the underutilized firms that we serve. The, the key details of this program uh, versus the DBE program is that, again, it's just for non-federally funded procurements, local procurements. It is only applicable to Minnesota-based firms, and we use an already existing certification. So it's not a separate certification. If you are already certified as one of the, the um, certifications listed there, you qualify as an MCUB. To talk a little bit about the timeline of how uh, kind of the journey uh, of the MCUB program, the program <coughs> was created in 2012 um, and has progressed uh, through today under, uh, as we progress, we are keeping in mind the vision of One Minnesota with Governor Walls. Uh, it, we expanded the program in 2016 due to seeing that there was more opportunity than just goal setting on construction contracts. We expanded it to goal setting on also professional technical and architecture and engineering. Uh, in 2018, after the disparity study was done, um, the results of that study brought awareness to the fact that we needed to do more. We initiated a second phase of the expansion of the program, uh, which I'll talk more about in the upcoming slides, but uh, basically implemented the sheltered market program from those uh, efforts, added some uh, another certification to the pool, and in 2019 uh, assigned council-wide purchasing goals. The next few slides go into much greater detail about the, the different phases and different steps of how the MCUB program has progressed throughout the years. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with these. They are um, on the presentation in front of you for you to review uh, as, you, as you wish. I want to talk a lot about the disparity study. Uh, it's uh, very important that a disparity study when agencies have uh, uh, small business programs that are race and gender based, disparities provide legal framework that the agency can um, reasonably defend their efforts on why they have these programs. The Met Council participated in a disparity study uh, with eight other agencies in 2017. <clears throat> the results came out in 2018. The data that we gave the consultant for the study was based on data from, uh, and it was all council procurements, locally funded procurements from 2011 to June of 2016. So June or 2016 was not a complete year, um, but the results from the study showed that um, there, there still obviously are disparities between women and minority firms, and the results of, of, of this study is what uh, provided, provided us with the rationale and motiv motivation uh, to make some significant changes moving forward. The consultant made several recommendations on how we could do things better at the council. They reviewed our program. Um, 
<coughs> it is what initiated phase two of the expansion and what has been implemented since approximately October of 2018. So it, it hasn't been that long since we've, we've taken these additional steps. Uh, the study really opened our eyes to the fact that we, we need to do better. Um, the first piece of the, ex the second phase of the expansion of the program was to enhance the doing business page on, on the metrocouncil.org to provide greater resources for some of these small businesses so that they, they had a better understanding of how to do business with the council, where to go, who to talk to, what our expectations were. We also increased our pool of MCUB firms to about 2,400 by adding 500 CERT certified firms. And CERT is the certification that is done by this and managed by the city of St. Paul. Now CERT itself as a program includes small businesses, minority owned small businesses and women owned small businesses. What we took out of the CERT program um, was just the women and minority owned small businesses and that uh, increased our pool by about 500 firms. Obviously, the more firms that we have in the pool, the greater the opportunity we are that we can find somebody to do the work. And we also developed what is known as MCUB Select. MCUB Select is a sheltered market solicitation process for goods and services. Uh, when I say sheltered market, that means that uh, if we have at least three MCUB firms that are likely to bid on the particular procurement, that solicitation only goes to MCUB firms. It is not solicited to any other firm, which guarantees that an MCUB will get that, will be awarded that work. When the disparity study came out and we realized that we needed to take progressive steps to uh, improve our program, we wanted to get some data behind where, where we've been in the past, and we quickly put together with, with the mechanisms we, we had in place at the time, um, we put together some numbers to, we wanted to create some kind of benchmark for moving forward. Where, where have we been and, and have an idea of where we want to go. Uh, what we found was with the data that we had, was that we were approximately, uh, by the end of 2018, at about 11.5% uh, utilization in construction. Our direct spend with these firms, which includes everything from purchasing cards to um, requests for quotes, um, to just contracts that are award awarded directly to MCUBs. Uh, again, these numbers are low, and we know we can do better. I don't want to focus too much on the past, only because we are so focused on moving forward and creating change. In 2019, April, uh, April 8th, actually, uh, the email went out that we are have committed to uh, an 8% of all goods and services uh, be spent with an MCUB and 12% of all construction and professional technical contracting. Um, this is a huge effort, it's necessary, and um, I feel it, it, it's gonna, it's gonna, uh, the, the return on investment is gonna create a lot of great positive results. Besides the, the council-wide purchasing goals, my team has, um, we have identified several areas for which we need to um, focus a lot of time and attention to. So, so of my four staff, all of them are dedicated to specific projects around um, finding out where our specific uh, scopes are that we, we need to utilize more participation, um, creating potential workshops. Uh, we're in the process of creating a forum of certified firms to get them to the table to help us understand what their needs actually are instead of us making the assumption that we, that we know what they need. Um, we are also in, in piggybacking on the announcement of the council-wide goals. Um, we have created, in, in coordination with procurement and communications, an internal and an external communications plan. So the internal plan, um, several emails just went out yesterday to all department heads, uh, letting them know that myself or somebody from my staff will be contacting them soon. And we're going to be starting from scratch and going department to department and talking about MCOB 
reinforcing what MCOV is, what the council-wide purchasing goals are, what the expectation is, and how we're going to help them meet those goals, and what the importance of, of why we set these goals are in the first place. Uh, we're in the process of working with IS and implementing technology to ensure that we can uh, accurately track these efforts. Again, we talk about the measurement of, of these things, and we need a way to be able to um, accurately track where, where our improvements are happening. And on a quarterly basis, we're going to be reporting to the management committee. And the, the, the results can be broken down by department and division, what we're spending our money on. And I think that's really important as we analyze this process moving forward. Um, the implementation, oops, I'm sorry, Imp implementation of the technology is, is, is this close from being finalized. So probably within the next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll have that uh, mechanism in place. Again, staff is working to identify purchasing areas where we historically have felt short of um, doing a very, uh, doing, uh, historically fell short of having utilization. So whether it be a, a specific um, scope, work type, skill set, uh, this is where we're identifying where we need to focus more activity. Uh, again, I touch base on organizing, um, creating workshops and how to do business with the council. This is something we're thinking of that will probably happen on a quarterly basis. We're refocusing our business development. Uh, the team is, is the, the primary functions of the small business unit is really focused around compliance. And what we're doing moving forward is um, focusing more on business development. You know, so the compliance will never happen if we, if we cannot get the businesses to the capacity level that they need to work on council's projects in the first place. Uh, the, and lastly, we're re-engaging with our community organizations and our small business industry partners. Um, we don't, we may not have everything that they need, but there are people out there that can help them that do. So um, they may not know where their resources are, and we can certainly help with that. Moving forward, again, we're we're renewing our commitment um, to the economic. Um, our responsibility to equity and economic uh, prosperity to the communities that we serve in the region. We're strengthening our processes and really reinforcing the message, not only um, to staff, but but externally that we're, we're changing how we do business at the council. Here are some numbers. I just wanted to get these out there, uh, some numbers from that I ran from Q1 already. These numbers are really broken down by the specific procurement type, um, goods and services, and how these how these items are procured. And again, keep in mind that, that the goal for goods and services did not come out until April 8th. So this is actually, uh, the, the numbers are not too bad considering that this is just genuine effort on, on our part. We are actually on track to meet that goods and services goal, if you look at the numbers from Q1. Next is the contracts. We break it up by contracts for which we have assigned contract goals and contracts for which no goals have been assigned. Again, there are certain contracts for which uh, um, <clears throat> it's not applicable to assign a goal. Uh, that just means that, that doesn't mean that participation isn't going to happen. It's just not mandated uh, on our part. So right now we're at about 3.4%. Um, that doesn't scare me in the least because most of our contracts, especially construction, are awarded in Q2. And at the end of the year is usually when we see uh, the most reporting as things get paid out and we see that utilization jump. Demographics from Q1. And, and like I said, Q1, um, I wanted to just get this out there, but I, I'm really excited about the work that we're doing. The, the internal education campaign is really what's going to kickstart these numbers. That is going to go, because council is a pretty big entity, um, that campaign is going to run all the way from May till June so that we can touch every single department. And, and from there, uh, I'm excited to look forward to reporting what has happened in Q2. With that, we'll um, open it up to um, 
questions if you have any specifically regarding our DBE and MCUB program. Any questions? Well, Council Member Shambliss and then <coughs> uh, Yes, I just have a question about the MCUB timeline. Um, I like the way that the progress has been happening and I'm not sure what your process was after you had your disparity study to, you know, kick into action, but um, it looks like, you know, you're on the road um, by having, you know, the MCUB segmented out and targeted in this way, um, I think you have a much better chance of reaching the outcome. So um, I, I think it's great and um, I, I hope it's going to be a successful model for others. Chair, council members, uh, thank you for the feedback. I appreciate that. Thank you. Council Member Musa. Thanks, Madam Chair. Can you go back to the slide that was showing uh, the racial makeup of uh, Native, Black, and Indian American? It was, I think, six slides back. You can. Ocean. Yep, so. That one. Yeah, yeah. So it seems to me that combined a native uh, black and uh, think African American was uh, less than seven. Can you explain more about that? Council member or, or chair, council members. I'm sorry. Could you clarify that? I think I'm seeing right. So it seems to me that uh, you know uh, the blacks only four percent and the Hispanics only three percent. And the next one percent. So I'm just wondering this disparity. What's going on here? Can you, can you explain? Are there barriers that's out there that needs to be removed, or just want to know more? Chair, council members, yes, that is absolutely the, the disparity that I'm referring to. Um, th this this reflects what we have done in the past and where our disparities lie, and that is also guiding our progress for our actions moving forward. Where where we see the most need or where our efforts need need to go. Okay. Council Member Fredson. Thank you, Chair. Um, so on slide 12, there's a reference to MCUB and it's saying that it's focused on Minnesota firms. And so my understanding then is that firms outside of Minnesota would not be eligible for participation in the program. <coughs> so I had to follow up. <coughs> Chair. So, Council members, yes, that is correct. Uh, DBE, DBE, the federal program, uh, applies to to nationwide firms, but MCUB is specific to Minnesota firms only. Okay, council member. One more, thank you. Um, and then, is there a, a dollar amount threshold and a subcontractor opportunity required for MCUB, or just the federal? Is that me? Uh, yes, there is. So when we look at contracts that come across our desk, the threshold is a minimum of, minimum of $100,000. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Lindstrom. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. I was going to mention as the chair of the Environment Committee, I've noticed already in my short time as chair, the two, three meetings that we've had, that we approve a lot of contracts. Yesterday it was on a lift station construction project and uh, some other product for one of our um, uh, um, one of our plants and so I was just thinking that um, as these come before the committee it would be helpful to know whether or not the contract that, that we are awarding is a DBE company or or an an MCUB um, company in the documentation that comes before the committee uh, ahead of time. It would be helpful to keep this top of mind for our committee, I know, and for the council as a whole, to know whether or not we're meeting our target or not. Ms. Uh, the chair, council members, I, I'm, tr I'm not sure where in the process it, it hits it hits the council. I'm assuming if, if it's at award time, that goal has already been established. So that information is available in terms of by the time it gets, by the time it gets here, it should be 
available that there is a goal set and what the goal is. Um, I don't see any reason why that couldn't be made available. Why don't we um, ask staff to do a follow-up to figure that out, whether it's with the regional administrator or with um, the environment, with Lisa Thompson, and that they could help figure out the right point to bring that in? Regional Administrator? Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, Council Members, uh, at award, when you're awarding construction contracts, I think there is no reason, I think Elaine is right, there is no reason that we could not list whether or not the firm receiving the award is a certified DBE or MCUB, because obviously the award contains the firm uh, and what the goal has been established at, because obviously they are aware of that goal as we establish that. Um, I, if for some reason I'm wrong about that, I'll let you know, but I'm almost certain that that's the case. Uh, there is an occasionally business items that come through that ask the council to allow us to issue an RFP for something or to, to send out a notice for bids, that would be a case where we obviously wouldn't know the firm and might not be able to say the goal at that point. But certainly on the back end, as we're awarding that information, we can share. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, council member Atlas Ingerbertson. Thanks, um, Chair. One of the things I'm curious about is um, with programs like this, oftentimes women rise or other ethnic groups, but our largest <coughs> communities of color are left behind. And we definitely see this here, so it's not a, a surprise. Um, I'm curious, and I know that you're gonna be doing some outreach with businesses to ascertain this, but I'd like to know just kind of what your initial thoughts are around what are the biggest barriers or needs that could be addressed and how could we help, I think. Um, to council men, member um, Lindstrom's suggestion, getting it in front of us, um, even when we're doing an RFP, making sure there's been a scan of DBEs and the MCUB list first before we go to RFP um, would be maybe another thing to do. Um, but uh, what are some of those things that rise to the top for you um, or that you have heard would make, um, make it better or are a barrier that we need to address? Ms. Ogilvie. Madam Chair, council members. Uh, so several things, and exactly to that point, uh, we we see definitely we definitely see areas of, and especially in the construction industry where we have a lot of work available, but we see the same firms bidding over and over and over again and getting all the work. Um, that is where my team is digging into um, specific scopes for which we know we have MCUB firms that could be available to do the work. I think the barriers that we we know of is that many of these firms may not many of these firms may be so small that they maybe just don't have the educational piece behind them to technically bid on a council project or most of it is they're not bidding as a prime contractor they're bidding as a subcontractor but even at that level they struggle to put together a competitive quote um, or they may not know that the opportunity even exists. Um, that is where my team is trying to, to pull in to find, try to figure out where the opportunity or where, where the barriers are that we need to address. Is it an ed educational workshop on, on how to do bidding or how that process looks? Um, I also know that um, capital finances can often be a problem. I'm not sure if that's something that, like, that we've, we've touched base on it before, but that is an area that there are financial resources out there. It, it's just pointing them in the right direction to, to be able to do it. Um, so capital is another big issue. Um, I would say those are our, our two primary things, making sure they have the technical capacity to, to be able to bid making sure that they know about it. Oh, one other thing I was just gonna mention, for these contracts that do not have goals, so there, there's nothing mandating this prime contractor to, to hire these MCUB firms. If there's no goal, we identify a list of firms for which my team physically takes that solicitation and, and emails those firms direct and says, he, you know, here, here's a solicitation that you might be interested in so that they don't have to go to our website and dig through uh, items to try and find the solicitation, we bring it to them. And then it's kind of up to them to bid on it if they want. But there again, 
they don't have the understanding or the capacity or the technical background to do that effectively, it, it doesn't work. Um, and, and that's what we're here to do. That's moving forward our priority. Council members, so, so are you going to offer classes on, for people on how to fill out these forms and so forth? I mean, that's what I've seen with other organizations. Yes, we are. Okay, and then when, do, when will that start? <clears throat> It, the timeline hasn't been flushed out yet, but we wanted to have something in place by mid second quarter. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Joe's <coughs> actually referring to that same slide of the, the demographics. I, I always um, stress the, the, the fact that we need to disaggregate the data uh, even more. Uh, the barriers that uh, an African-American business owner born and raised in St. Paul may be different from an East African immigrant that just arrived here yesterday as far as establishing a business, or a Latino business owner who's a fourth generation born and raised in East St. Paul versus somebody who just came last week from Guatemala. So we, I think we need to, to to make sure that our data is more detailed because the, the barriers and the needs of those uh, constituencies are gonna be different. And if we group them <coughs> under those large categories, we're gonna be missing a lot of those nuances that really go to the, to the bottom line of why those folks are not bidding in our projects. So that's just a suggestion of how you can perhaps uh, change your processes moving forward. Thank you. Madam Ms. Chair, Oakley. Council Members, I think that is a great suggestion. <clears throat> that is a really, uh, a really good point in terms of something that I hadn't thought a lot about, but I think that um, we're going to keep that in mind as we reach out to our community partners because those are the ones uh, that can help us understand better what their, what their members' needs are because they do see it. They see everything from, you know, immigrant to firms that have been born and raised here. So I, th I think that's a really good point and I appreciate that, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Council Member Barber. I think I might have missed you in a follow-up before. Oh. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to um, yeah, help answer the question from Council Member Lindstrom a little bit. Um, I know in Transportation Committee, we do get some of that information, especially on some of the bigger contracts, um, especially a lot of those fall into the DBE. Um, category so we do get that information and so I think you can just reach out to your staff um, that, that uh, helps with the environment committee to ask that information be added and also for everyone if just for a good reference to look at the history in some of these contracts is we do uh, have a quarterly procurement report and for some of the different contracts with different dollar amounts it actually lists the DBE or Min Cup goal or even if it didn't have a goal if they're reported and kind of can give you some history and perspective on some of those big contracts so this would be very helpful for you to probably go back and look at how does one access the quarterly reports? Do you get those reports uh, to you, or uh, did the council get those? Or uh, would, would Madam Chair, it comes through the management committee is where we get those reports, and so I'm sure we could, yeah, That's make true. sure it gets. Yeah, I think if other people want them, what should they request them to the RA, or should they? Can you? What do you suggest? Uh, Madam Chair, Council Members, they are available on our website, but to save you the time of digging through agendas, if you just let. Your council member support person know that you'd like to receive the latest management report uh, they can certainly get it to you from last quarter going forward uh, certainly the office of equal opportunity after presenting that to management can forward that to all council members that's not an issue but the, if you're looking for back quarters they are available currently on our website thank you uh, council member Barber, we're gonna I, I know you have what is it 6 30 that you're picking the tab members 6 20. and is that in this room no okay <laughs> so but there's a but are there other people in this Yes, the council, council member Fredson and council member okay. Campbell will. Okay, so we we'll need to sneak out. Keep okay. doing that, and we'll we're going to take as many questions as we can, and then we'll do it like kind of a time check whether we want to try to get through the next third, and then delay the last third, or if we should delay the last two thirds, which is which is fine. Uh, council member Muse. I think I'm sure. It's only you to know many council members at this table have a deep ties with underserved communities, and we are you can use it as a resource to help, especially with the outreach part. Uh, I am aware of the technical, you know, uh, capacity issue uh, with many minority-owned uh, small business owners who lack access to this. 
but we can brainstorm some solutions. I don't have all the answers, but we are here as a resource. We want you to be successful. We want to, you know, be the Korea. I know you're committed. I know you're working hard, but it's a very challenging issue, and the numbers are not great right now, but we are committed to help in whatever capacity we can. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Lee. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, so we just had management committee uh, right before this, and a similar question came up earlier <coughs> from the Chair, uh, Council Member Ferguson asking about what kind of roadblocks came up for uh, businesses. And the transportation finance um, folks um, did say that uh, there was a, a cool innovative example um, that, that we did as a council where uh, recently um, a lot of small firms, um, there's when, when firms are bidding to do work along a, a rail line, there's an arcane rule that you have to have uh, insurance coverage uh, if you're working on anywhere within 50 feet of a, a rail line. Most firms don't have that kind of uh, random but expensive insurance. And so the council had decided that we would eat that cost. And, and it's usually like, like a couple thousand dollars, but we eat the co we, we made a deal with our insurance brokers and we eat the cost and ask them to pay. Sometimes we'll waive the fee or just ask them to pay $100 or a, a smaller amount. And so my point is if, where there's a will, there's a way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member Ferguson. Thank you. Uh, just a, a couple of um, quick thoughts. One is that I think as we look at the MCOM goals, um, to a couple of points earlier, we may want to have, maybe it makes sense to have separate goals for um, the African American, Hispanic, and Native American businesses because we could achieve the goal but actually not make any progress towards ending disparities. And I think part of the pr purpose of doing this and doing the disparity study was to reduce disparities. So if the numbers stay the same as they do in that slide, 90% of the work would go to Caucasian and Asian Americans who in the disparity study did not have disparities, right? So um, we may, could we think about having a separate goal for the two sides and, and um, work on really focusing on, on some of those other pieces so we can achieve both of those. Um, the second is uh, just thinking about prime contractors. The system set up to require minority firms to be subservient to a majority firm uh, to be the lead in, in these projects, which um, I think there's probably historic reasons why it was written that way when these programs were established 30, 40 years ago. Uh, we might want to think about how we can try to encourage minority firms to not have to be, uh, even if they can take on the project as a, as a prime, there, there's no benefit for them. They don't. There's no, and we don't get to track that as a as a uh, a win in our system um, because it, it's only the, for most of the contracts. It's only on the DV side. It's really only the subs that are tracked, as opposed to if we're able to get a prime that's a minority firm or a women-owned firm that does the work. There's not that same sort of benefit. So thinking about how we might build it, especially on the non-federal piece, so that uh, we could look at that. The second, uh, the last one is on the payment terms, just thinking about on, on the payment terms. One thing we should probably, we could think about is if we could speed up how quickly we pay um, these MCUP firms, that will significantly help their ability to uh, manage their cash flow. And so, you know, I think Ramsey County tries to pay within, I think it's like 10 days or so from receipt of invoice. Um, you know, I think we should be, as soon as we get the invoice process, you have to check out um, as soon as possible. And, and that in itself, you know, instead of uh, so like some government agencies wait 60, 90 days to pay people, um, that's float that people have to go out and fund if we can eliminate that. Um, obviously, we have cash in the balance sheet. We can make it happen as long as the work's been done. The invoice is approved. Let's get the checks out. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Fredson. I just had a quick follow up. Thank you, Chair. I had a quick follow up on that. I'm not understanding why a prime wouldn't count your credit. Councilmember Ferguson? Sure. <laughs> so it's, it, uh, it's, it, it's a bit of an arcane piece in the way the way the rules on the DBE side were are written, right? So um, our biggest example in this state has been, uh, was used to be anyways, was Thor. So Thor had to work as a sub to Mortensen for all these projects because that's how they got credit to meet the goals. If Thor was the prime, Thor would have to go out and hire another minority contractor to do the sub work to meet the goals. So they can have kept being the sub to a Mortensen. And that's true about most of the way, the, and it's not necessarily anything we're doing per se, because of the way the rules have historically been written, we'd want it, we'd need to 
rethink how we write those rules. But that's the way it's it is not just here and not just Met Council, but uh, Viking Stadium, all the other projects were are written that way. So um, other states do it differently, uh, but that's historically been the way it's it's been done here. So if if our firm does work and we are the prime. And we would have a goal, we, even though the whole contract in theory is done by a minority-owned firm, you'd have to go and hire other minority-owned firms to meet the goal, which for most minority firms kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense because we are a minority firm and we're doing 100% of the project. Why would we be required to go and hire another minority firm? So what happens is sometimes people will try to find a majority-owned firm to be the in-between so then they can be the minority firm on the project, which is not doesn't really forward our goals but it's kind of it's the way people work around it okay thank you good discussion so it is about 5 55 um, there's a couple ways we can go we still have reports uh, and that would give we, by the time i got through those um giving the people who are still have the transportation committee meeting some time to freshen up a little or get something to eat before they go into their next meeting uh, we could try to get through the transit one, but I think we all, I don't know about you, but that's a really important one, right? They're all important. And I know the staff came here, uh, especially for the presentation, but I wanna make sure I uh, involve the council in this decision. So input to council member Lee. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I move that we uh, uh, adjourn so that um, we could we'd, we'd pick it up later because a few of us are also going to model cities. Uh, they have a, the annual meeting tonight. Oh, okay. Metro cities. Metro, cities. Metro cities. I'm sorry. Cities? Okay. Metro cities. Ah, okay. <coughs> what time does that set? Probably start. Uh, Six thirty. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody else? I remember Ingelbert. At what's Ingelbert saying? We'll have a class. I'm saying my last name. Sorry. sorry. It's all good. <laughs> it's phonetic. Just don't get nervous. Yeah, Inga and Brett had a son. Okay. And uh, then uh, Atlas. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um. No, I just, I, I, I really don't want to rush through this content. I think it's so important for so many of us. And I, but I also want to just, um, and I want to also just recognize staff um, and appreciate you coming out. I think it can be really frustrating when you come out for a night like this and then, and have something like this happen. But I just want to say it, it matters to all of us so deeply. I don't want to shortchange your efforts coming together. I, this conversation tonight has been so powerful for me. Um, I just wanted to like snap my fingers as and 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 sit down and take notes as Chris was talking, um, Councilmember Ferguson. Um, it's that kind of those kind of moments were like yes. Um, so I I hope we can um, pause and come back so we can really continue this learning together. Okay, thank you. Well said. Uh, let's. Um, so what I'd like to do is. Uh, Thank you and um, suspend the presentations at this point. We'll come back another time, hopefully the next, if you leave the next meeting, potentially we have to see. Uh, we do have some other things committed to the agenda, so we will find a time to slot this back in as soon as we can. It's important. And thank you again to the staff. We wanna make sure we give this the full attention. What I'd like to do before we do is try to get through the reports quickly, just so if, if people have things they really wanna uh, discuss that they can um, let us know about that. And so um, council members, any reports? Uh, run the Barber. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to report really quickly that on April 18th, I attended the uh, Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Fry State of the City address, and where his sort of top line issues were affordable housing and homelessness. He committed to that as a priority and highlighted the work of the City of Minneapolis Affordable Housing Trust Fund program. Uh, he spoke about creating three to four uh, more dedicated bus lanes within the city of Minneapolis in the near future. And he spoke quite a bit uh, about what he called economic inclusion. And to quote him, the, he said, the city of Minneapolis needs to do a better job finding specific solutions that under the legacy of institutionalized exclusions of black people, indigenous people, people of color, and immigrants, that furthers the economic, social, and uh, economic, social independence of these communities. And I just thought that really overlaid sort of what we're talking about tonight. 
but certainly with our work here at the Met Council. Mm, thank, thank you. you. Councilmember Barber. Thank you, Madam Chair. A couple of things. Uh, yesterday, I attended Carver County Leaders, which is a group of elected officials out in Carver County that meet quarterly. And then we went on a lovely tour of Carver County with Councilmember uh, Ferguson, Fedson, and with the chair. So thank you very much. I think it was a great tour, and people were really happy to see all of you out in the, in the district. And I've heard a lot of really good feedback already. A um, couple of things. We are doing interviews for both TAC and TAB over this, this week and next week. And so we'll be putting, hopefully, recommendations forward to to you by the end of next week I'm hopeful and then also at tab um, we are doing um, there's a generation of a regional solicitation work group that we're looking at to look at the regional solicitation process and it's a cross-functional group from uh, different areas we've got a couple of council members so uh, Councilmember Cummings is going to help with it and then uh, council member channels will be our alternate for that group so we've got some council member representation with it as well Thank you. So at some other point, I'd like to know the timeline on that and how that's going to work. I think that's a really good idea to look at the process and how that's going to work. It's a quick timeline. We need to have something back out um, by September so that we can uh, inform the next solicitation round. So it's a, it'll be kind of an intense work. Thing. Thank you. Anything else? Oh, uh, Councilmember Atlas. Inga and Brett Hedison. Uh, I'm trying to think of Inga <laughs> and Brett. <laughs> Um, I just want to share that uh, we're also doing equity advisory um, committee um, interviews um, starting this week. I think we'll be this week and next week yep. um, and have a lot of great candidates we'll be interviewing. And I also um, visited with the Go city of uh, Golden Valley's um, council uh, last week. Um, had a great conversation with them with lots of excitement and support for um, the Met Council. And so I'm looking forward to doing more of those, but um, just wanted to share their excitement and um, readiness for all things transit and development. It's really fun. Exciting. It's great to see you guys out in the communities. And anything else? I know uh, I will just say briefly, I went to um, the GARE annual meeting. Uh, which was three days intensive of race equity work, uh, talking everything about how to make plans, to um, how to reduce conflicts or help with conflicts, to work groups, to all kinds of things. So come back that with ideas. I went with uh, Sai and with Mitzi, and so it was great to have um, other members of the staff there to be able to <coughs> kind of process because there was a lot happening for three days. Uh, and it was a really, really good experience in hoping to bring some of that knowledge back to the group. So. With that, next we have uh, regional administrator. Anything? Yes. General counsel? No. Anything? Is there a motion for adjournment? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. second. Then motion and 